Hi, I'm Adam. This is the Machine Tech video blog, and today I'd like to talk a little bit about the different types of positive displacement pumps. At first glance, there seem to be so many unique designs of positive displacement pump that it can be a little confusing. And it really wouldn't make a whole lot of sense to try and cover every single possibility in this one video. But what I have tried to do is to break it down into nine basic mechanisms. At the heart of any pump, you'll find one of these mechanisms. I've also tried to show a real-world example of each different type of pump. Each basic mechanism falls within one of two categories based on what type of motion it utilizes. We have reciprocating and we have rotary. Reciprocating pumps are the first category. Every reciprocating pump utilizes some kind of expanding and contracting chamber and a series of check valves in order to draw fluid into the pump and then direct it out into the system. To illustrate this concept, let's take a look at pump number one, the piston pump. The mechanism consists of a reciprocating piston inside of a cylinder with check valves at both the inlet and the outlet. When the piston is on its suction stroke, which is the upstroke in this case, the chamber inside of the cylinder expands, the pressure drops, the check valve on the suction side opens, and fluid is admitted through the inlet. By definition, check valves permit flow in one direction only, so they help to prevent backflow and direct the fluid through the pump. As the valve on the suction side of the pump opens, the valve on the discharge side closes. On the discharge stroke, which is the downstroke here, the piston pushes on the fluid in the cylinder. The pressure rises. The suction valve now closes and the discharge valve opens to release fluid into the system. Here's an example of a common piston pump called an axial piston pump. This pump is a tad more complex than our little demonstration, but the pumping action is generated in exactly the same way. The axial piston pump has multiple pistons equally spaced on the end of a rotating angled plate. As the plate rotates, the pistons are driven into and out of their respective cylinders. You can clearly see the motion here. Like most reciprocating pumps, piston pumps are relatively efficient and they're capable of generating very high pressures. Pump number two is the plunger pump. Plunger pumps look very similar to piston pumps, but they work a little differently. Unlike a tight-fitting piston, a plunger fits loosely in its cylinder. Just like when your bathtub overflows because you filled it too full with water before jumping in, the physical mass of the plunger alters the size of the chamber and displaces the fluid. This is a triplex plunger pump, which uses three staggered plungers for smoother flow delivery, but it is otherwise the same as our demonstration. Pump number three is the diaphragm pump. Unlike a piston or a plunger, an elastomer diaphragm is flexible. When it flexes, it changes the volume of the chamber, causing fluid to be drawn into or pushed out of the chamber. Our example is an air-powered double diaphragm pump. The pump is essentially two diaphragm pumps oriented back to back with the diaphragms linked by a connecting rod so it can pump on both strokes. One unique property of the diaphragm pump is that it doesn't require a seal because the wet and dry sections of the pump are completely separated by the diaphragm itself. The second category of positive displacement pump is the rotary pump. All rotary pumps utilize some kind of a moving chamber that traps fluid and carries it from one side of the pump to the other side. 
To illustrate this concept, let's look at pump number four, the gear pump. Actually, this configuration is more properly called an external gear pump. The mechanism consists of two rotating gears, one driving the other inside of an oval housing. At the suction inlet, fluid is trapped in a chamber between the gear teeth and the inside wall of the housing. The rotary motion moves the chamber from one side of the housing to the other side. And as the gear teeth rotate back into mesh, the chamber is closed, forcing the fluid through the discharge outlet. Another configuration of the gear mechanism is the internal gear pump. In this type of pump, an outer gear in a circular housing drives an offset inner gear. The gears are separated by a crescent. Fluid is trapped in one of two moving chambers between the inner gear and the crescent or between the outer gear and the crescent. As with the external gear pump, the rotary motion moves the chamber from one side of the housing to the other side. And as the gear teeth rotate back into mesh, the chamber is closed, forcing the fluid through the discharge outlet. Pump number five is the lobe pump. Lobe pumps function very similarly to external gear pumps, but the rotors are driven independently by external timing gears. The rotors have two or more lobes, and the moving chamber is formed between the outer surfaces of the lobes and the inside wall of the oval housing. As one of the lobes rotates back toward the center of the housing, the tight clearance between the lobe and the other rotor closes the chamber and forces the fluid through the discharge outlet. Pump number six is the vein pump. A vein pump rotor has slots in it for sliding veins. Centrifugal force flings the veins out to contact the inside wall of the circular housing, forming a sealed chamber. Since the rotor is offset in the housing, the veins extend and retract during rotation. The chamber increases in size at the suction inlet, drawing fluid in. At the discharge outlet, the chamber decreases in size, pushing fluid out. The nice thing about vein pumps is that they automatically compensate for wear because the veins are constantly forced against the wall of the housing. Pump number seven is the peristaltic pump. Peristaltic pumps contain fluid within a flexible hose. The hose is pinched between the rollers and the inside wall of the housing. As the rollers revolve around a center axis, they squeeze the fluid like a tube of toothpaste and move it through the housing to the discharge outlet. As with diaphragm pumps, peristaltic pumps do not require a seal because the fluid's completely contained inside the hose. They really excel at pumping high viscosity fluids with very large solids. I've even seen them pump whole cherries without significantly damaging them. Pump number eight is the screw pump. Screw pumps can have a single shaft with large threads on it, but they usually have two or three. The center shaft drives the other shafts, like a screw or a worm gear. As the shafts rotate in the housing, fluid trapped in the gaps between the screw threads progresses along the length of the housing and is delivered to the discharge outlet. If you've ever seen an auger or a screw conveyor, this is pretty much the same thing. Our final pump is pump number nine, the progressive cavity pump. These bizarre little pumps may look somewhat like screw pumps, but they function differently. The rotor is shaped like a helix, and the housing is molded into the shape of a double helix. As the rotor rotates and oscillates inside of the housing, it forms a cavity which progresses along the length of the housing. Any fluid trapped in this progressing cavity is delivered to the discharge outlet. Well, there's your introduction to the various different mechanisms that make up the positive displacement pumps. And that's it for today from the Machine Tech video blog. I hope you learned something.